scripture this morning is a long one. It's John's version of the Easter story, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood outside, weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look in the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. There's a Jewish tradition that says, where the Messiah is, there is no misery. It's an understandable idea, isn't it? It makes sense. We talk about that time and place when God's kingdom has come in its fullness, and there is no more crying, there is no mourning, there is no hunger, there is no sickness, there is no need, and all of the visions that the Old Testament prophets portrayed, all of it is filled full. It makes sense, that tradition. And, and many Christians hold a very similar, kind of a triumphalistic view, where God will fix everything. And indeed, it's on its way if we just open our eyes and look. A time when the first will be last and the last will be first. The meek will inherit the earth. Those at the edges on the margins will be welcomed to the places of honor at the wedding banquet. But those of us who are sitting here have a little bit more sophisticated view of reality, maybe a little bit more cynical view of reality. And we know there is more to the story than that, isn't there? Evangelical writer Philip Yancey, in his book, What Good is God?, sees a, a bit of that, where he says that in Jesus, this statement from this Jewish tradition is turned upside down. And in Jesus, it says, where there is misery, there is the Messiah. Where there is misery, there is the Messiah. And that, that is certainly where today's scripture begins, isn't it? 
John starts the story a little bit before the other Gospels. They, they begin with the sun rising. John starts by telling us it was still dark. And I think for John, that is both metaphor and literal. While it was still dark, Mary got up and went to the tomb. Jesus as far as Mary knew, was dead. Everything was dark. If any of the other characters in these gospel stories could speak to us at this point and tell us what they were thinking, they probably would say something like, I'll tell you about God's plan. We followed Jesus for three years. We gave up everything. Because it seemed like he was really starting something new, something special, something from God. Our hopes took wings like eagles. Our dreams soared. It seemed that daily something amazing was happening. We saw healings, barriers broken down, sins forgiven and poured out grace and love. We heard words that stirred our souls. We dreamt dreams of a new world. And it seemed to be taking shape all around us. And then, in a moment, Jesus was taken by the soldiers and we scattered. We knew it could be us next. After a short trial, they crucified him. Not like a common criminal, but like a terrorist. No angels came to rescue him. The crowds didn't rise up and, and, and shout, Hosanna, again, and stand for him. The Romans did not repent of their sins. The Hebrew leaders didn't suddenly hear a word from God and say, wait, wait, he is the one. The only sound we heard was the hammer driving the nails through his wrists into those wooden beams and roars of pain. No new kingdom took shape. He died and was buried, and we were left alone. And so we hid, trying to figure out whether we needed to fear the same end for ourselves, whether we should try to rebuild some kind of life, or should we all just run away. If they could speak to us, that's what the disciples would tell us as Mary got up while it was still dark and went to the tomb. None had any hope left. Everything they had hoped for, dreamt of, was sealed in a borrowed tomb. It was still dark. It was still dark. And so Mary gets up while it's still dark to go to the tomb and pay her final respect. Now, we're not sure really what she was planning to do once she got there. Was this some custom that she was trying to fulfill? Was, was she just wanting to express her grief one more time? Was she planning to go to the tomb and bang on that rock and yell at Jesus for leaving them all with no hope? Could have been all of those things together. But we know one thing for sure. She wasn't going there expecting to find that Jesus was raised. Indeed, when the stone is gone and the body is not there, her assumption is that someone moved his body somewhere else. And she just wanted to know where it was. She arrives the stone is rolled away, the grave is empty, and she did not understand because it was still dark. There was no hope, there was no faith. And so she stands in the cemetery weeping. But we know that God was at work even while it was still dark. When there was no hope, when there were no possibilities, we know 
that God was at work while it was still dark. It didn't matter if no one understood or no one could see what was going on. The love of God was at work. Death was being defeated. Grief, despair, hopelessness did not have the final word. It was still dark, and God was at work. While it was still dark, God rolled the stone away, and new life burst forth. This lone woman with a tarnished reputation was the only one to brave the darkness. This one whom no one would believe, and indeed nobody did believe. That funny little statement earlier on in the passage where the disciple whom Jesus loved goes into the tomb and sees that Jesus is not there. And it says, and he believed. Well, it didn't mean he believed Jesus was risen. It made, oh yeah, well, I guess Mary was telling us the truth. They stole, they stole the body. And then they leave, and she still is there, standing in the dark, crying. And then she hears her name spoken aloud, and the darkness is dispelled. She is seen. She is known. She is loved. Life bursts forth. Light overcomes the darkness. And Mary returns to the disciples and speaks that first sermon that was ever preached and which, like many sermons, no one really listened to. And she says, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. It's easy to find darkness, isn't it? <laughs> we are living through a political season that would be funny if it wasn't real. And indeed, a generation ago, if someone had written a book describing a political season like this one, it would not have sold because it would have been too ridiculous to imagine. We have a media that is intent on fomenting fear and insecurity and has every ability to do just that and are doing just that and making us all afraid and insecure. We have information silos presenting worlds that are as different as they could possibly be. And yet, the folk who live by those two different information silos own that vision and see nothing of the other. We have a world that continues to be broken. The Middle East is boiling again. And our mainstream media and the other media aren't even reporting about what is going on. A march of 30,000 people, and most of us probably didn't even hear about it. And of course, there are the more personal darknesses, aren't there? Loss of loved ones, the insecurities that we feel as we find ourselves beset by all of that global stuff. insecurity of our lives. It's easy to know the darkness and, and to say like Philip Yancey does that where there is misery there we find the Messiah because we know, those of us who are here, we know, that's why we're here, that in our misery Jesus comes to us and stands with us, and embraces us, and sometimes, yes indeed, cries with us. But it is Easter, isn't it? 
It is Easter, and we know that there is more to the story than just that. It's not triumphalism, it's not that shallow victory kind of an idea, but it is the reality that just as God is with us in the midst of the darkness, God is also there rolling away the stone, and God is also with us in the full day that follows, even when we still feel as if we stand in the dark. And I have seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord in the darkness, I've seen the Lord in the full day, and I have seen the Lord in those times and places where we don't even feel like we need to see the Lord. And you have too. During Paul's service on this past Friday, there were some wonderful stories told and laughter and sharing in addition to the grief. One man stood up and shared his story of when he was 79 years old and came into Via Verde as the young buck and he was going to play ping pong against Paul and he knew this guy's in his 90s, I'm going to whoop him. <laughs> and all of us who knew Paul laughed because we knew. <laughs> We knew Paul. And that young 79 year old predictably lost. <laughs> and we laughed. And we cried. And we saw the Lord there with us in and through it all. As we have grieved Connor's death and tried to make sense of such a loss, and what in the world do you do with a 24 year old? With, with memories held in our hearts and dreams forever unfulfilled. And we laugh, and we cry, and we see the Lord. Yesterday at the Easter egg hunt, watching the children laugh and run even though they weren't supposed to, and pick up all of those eggs and share the eggs and just have a wonderful time together. And those, those few sensitive adults who came and said, this is such a lovely, lovely time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we saw the Lord. We have a stately blue heron who visits the churchyard every now and again when he gets a particular taste for gophers. <laughs> but I see the Lord when I look at him. And this past week, I was watching out my window, and, and, and the birds all visit the fountain outside my office window, and there was a species of hummingbird that I've never seen before. Tiny, 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 smallest one I've ever seen, and it was a copper color. I don't know what it is. It was gorgeous. I saw the Lord. And the blue bellies as they skitter across the patio. I've seen the Lord. This past week, especially, one of my Hindu friends posted a whole bunch of things up on Facebook. And they all had to do with her interactions with some of her Christian friends. And I thought of this wonderful melting that happens when people of very radically different faith traditions come together seeking for truth and trying to experience the holy even though their pathways to get there and their understanding of what it means are radically different but they still walk together children and don't get weary and I saw the Lord I see the Lord as people cook wonderful food, and we sit and we share, and we eat way more than we need to, but it's good. And people run electronics and make sure that the words show up that are supposed to be there when they're supposed to be there, that people play instruments and sing, and, and I don't know about you, but this morning when the band was playing, I just got shit. I did. I did. It's 
people teach classes, as they hide Easter eggs, as they fix things, as they care for children, as they give to budgets, as they volunteer for mission projects near and far, as those folk are there with and for each other, as often as not unconsciously and without expectations, but through all of that, I see the Lord. Heck, I even see the Lord in a grown man wearing a bunny suit handing out carrots. <laughs> <laughs> and children who would never eat a vegetable chomping away on that carrot just because the Easter bunny gave it to them. <laughs> I've seen the Lord in the darkness. Because in those moments when I have known misery, the Messiah was there. And some of those times, they don't get fixed. Some of those times, the Messiah just sits and cries with me. I have seen those moments when the full day breaks forth and the stone rolls away and new life presents itself where it seemed that all there was was death. And I have seen the Lord in all of the times in between. He is risen. He is risen indeed. <laughs> One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And he is here with us and among us. I have seen the Lord, and so have you.